Welcome to Advanced Quantum Chemistry and my second lecture on correlated wave function methods. In my first lecture on the correlated wave function methods, I discussed that the exact wave function, meaning the solution to the Schrodinger equation, can be written as a linear combination of all the Slater determinants which can be generated from a complete one electron basis set. And that one way of determining these expansion coefficients here would be to use the variation principle. And this is precisely what one does in the method which is called configuration interaction. So the wave function is written as this uh, linear combination of all the Slater determinants one can generate from the finite one electron basis set. Then the energy is calculated as the usual expectation value here divided by the norm because this wave function up here, at least in the way I've written it here, is not normalized. And then one uses the variation principle, saying one minimizes the energy because one knows that if one writes the energy or calculates the energy in this way, then the energy calculated with an approximate wave function will always be larger or in the best case equal to the exact energy. So one gets closest to the extra exact energy if one finds the minimum of this energy here. And as you know, I mean, finding a minimum of a function is uh, you do that by setting the first derivative to equal to zero. And the variables here in this function are, of course, the uh, expansion coefficients. So one takes the derivatives of this energy expression with all respect to all the um, expansion coefficients here for single excited determinants, double excited determinants, and so forth, and sets them all to zero. This gives a very large set of linear homogeneous equations, which one can uh, write in a matrix form, and one actually can rewrite it in form of an eigenvalue equation. And here I've written up uh, this eigenvalue equation written in a matrix form. Here we have the Hamiltonian matrix, and the elements of the Hamiltonian matrix are matrix elements, meaning integrals over the Hamiltonian with the different Slater determinants. And we'll look at that in on the next slide. Uh, e is the energy, of course, and the eigenvalues, and C are the expansion coefficients. Now, for n equals to zero, meaning the lowest eigenvalue of this equation, and therefore the lowest eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian matrix, that is our approximation to the ground state, and all the and we know that this uh, will always give us a higher energy than the exact ground state. And uh, all the other eigenvalues are then approximation to excited states. Based on the configuration and the action method is that it is a two-step procedure, because one first has to do a hard to fog calculation to get the hard to fog. Uh, a Slater determinant, or um, more important, to get orbitals. So we get the orbitals from a hard to fog calculation, and then we keep the orbitals fixed, we don't change them anymore, and with those orbitals we generate all those uh, Slater determinants here. So one might ask oneself, would it not be possible to also uh, change the orbitals in our uh, calculation when we change the configuration interaction coefficients? Now let's look at this uh, Hamiltonian matrix. Let's look at this matrix uh, where uh, here the wave function in the bra and the wave function in the cat are the Slater determinants in which we expand our wave function. So we will have uh, one element here, the very first element where I would have the hard to fog in the bra and the hard to fog wave function or determinant in the cat, so that, that's one element. Then I will have several elements where I have the hot fog here in the bra and all the single excited determinants in, in the cat and many more where I have the double excited determinants in the, in the cat and even more if I have triples and so forth. And the same I can change the determinants here in the, in the bra as well. I can put in single excited, double excited, triple excited determinants. So I get this huge matrix. Now um, these are matrix elements over the Hamiltonian with different uh, determinants. So um, here I can use now, or should use the Slater-Connor rules um, to evaluate them. 
Uh, in addition, I can use also uh, the Brayong theorem, which we talked about in my lectures about Hubble-Fock theory. Uh, and I hope you remember that the Brayong theorem says that a matrix element of the Hamiltonian with the Hubble-Fock Slater determinant in any of the single excited determinants is zero. So this whole block here with how to fog in the bra and all the different single excited determinants in the cat, they're all zero and similar, of course, the uh, vice versa. And remember, the reason for that was that uh, this matrix element with how to fog and uh, single excited determinant, if you evaluate that using the Slater Conan rules, you find out that this is just a matrix element of the Fock uh, matrix with where we have an occupied orbital and a virtual orbital uh, as, as the two uh, integrals. And uh, if those orbitals were uh, obtained, if those orbitals are the eigenfunctions to the Fock operator, then we know that the whole block of the Fock matrix where you have uh, occupied orbital and a virtual orbital, they're all zero. So, so this, these are all zero. Now, let's look, we have how to fog and triples, as I wrote here, is, is zero. This block is also zero. Uh, and that's just a consequence of the slater Conan rules, because in when we have a, a how to fog determinant here, for example, in the bra, and a triple excited determinant here in the cat, then the difference the, in, in orbitals between the two determinants is three. And remember from the slater Conan rules, um, with the, the Hamiltonian we have, um, if there's a difference larger than two orbitals, then the matrix element that integral is zero. So we only get matrix elements which are not zero if we have hard to fog, either of course with hard to fog, that's actually just the hard to fog energy here, uh, and hard to fog with double excited determinants. But with all the high ones, triple, quadruple excited determinants, all the matrix elements are zero. And similar, if we start with a single excited determinant here, with hard fog, that's zero because of Brayong theorem, um, we get something with single excited, single excited, we get something single excited, double excited, we get something with those single excited and triple excited determinants, where uh, the triple excitation here includes the excitation which we have in the single excited here, so that the difference is again only at most two uh, uh, spin orbitals. But again, singly and quadruple excited determinants is going to be zero. So out here, all this, all what comes out there is zero. And uh, finally, the double excited, then we have something without the fog. We have the single excited, double, double of course. We will have some elements with the triple, we will have some elements with the quadruple excited determinants, but with the pentuple excited determinants is again going to be zero. So at most we will have always only uh, five blocks here through the Hamiltonian matrix, five the diagonal plus two subdiagonal uh, blocks which have non-zero elements. All the rest is zero. Here, uh, the Hamiltonian matrix then if we do a CI singles calculation, the Hamiltonian matrix consists only of this part then. And you can see this matrix is what is called block diagonal. Uh, we have here one block that's only one element, that's the outer fog energy. And then we have this block of uh, where we have single excited determinants with single excited determinants. So if I diagonalize a matrix which uh, is block diagonal, then of course, uh, I can might as well just diagonalize the block separately because I will get the same result. So the lowest energy I will get is just a hard to fog energy. And then I get all, I mean, I diagonalize this part and I will get uh, energies which are higher than the hard to fog energy. See that from the Hamiltonian matrix because the only determinants which actually interact with the hard to fog determinant, meaning where the matrix elements over the Hamiltonian is not zero, are double excited determinants. So if you want to prevent uh, your lowest energy to be just a hard to fog energy, you have to include double excited determinants in your uh, wave function. So this many more, there are many more double excited determinants than there would be single excited determinants. So if we can interaction. Now, one of the CI methods is called full CI. 
And full CI is the method where we really have included all the determinants which we can generate from the one electron basis set. So this is really the, the full expansion in whatever we can get from the one electron base set, um, which in actual calculation always has to be finite. So doing this full CI calculation, we will get for the ground state energy, we will get the exact energy exact as as exact as it is possible in the given one electron base set. So this is the best result you can achieve in the one electron basis set. And then if you subtract from this uh, solution the hutter fock energy, you will get the correlation energy, the exact correlation energy, but only, of course, in this given uh, one electron basis set. Um, these kind of calculations are sort of the, the reference values for all other methods. Uh, unfortunately, they are so large and time-consuming and require so much memory that they are only possible for small systems and small basis sets. All the other kind of CI calculations, as you can see, again, what you do in a CI, I mean, they ought to include configuration. Yes, this is are called truncate CI calculation, configuration interaction calculation. In all those, one only includes a subset of the possible determinants, meaning not, not all of the possible determinants. And typically what one does, one includes determinants of a particular type. For example, in a method which is called CI singles, where one includes only the single excited determinants. The uh, lowest energy which you get uh, when you do a CI singles calculation uh, is going to be just a hard to fuck energy. And that's a consequence of the Brion theorem, because that means the CI single method is not a method for calculating the ground set energy, but it can be used to calculate uh, approximation to excited state energies. And the excited state energies or the excited state wave functions are then approximated by a linear combination of single excited determinants. In order to obtain a correction to the hard to fuck energy, one has therefore to include double excited determinants. And you can also see I doubles method, but as you get the double excited determinants, we might as well throw the single excited determinants extra in. So the sort of cheapest CI method for the ground state uh, energy is CI single and doubles, where we include single and double excited determinants. This method, CI single and doubles, is conceptually very simple because it's you write the wave function as expansion in single double excited determinants, and then you just use the variation principle. Uh, so you do a linear variation in calculus. However, actually nowadays it is not as much used anymore. And that has one particular reason. And the reason is that um, energy is calculated uh, with CI single doubles, and actually with all kinds of uh, truncated CI, are not size extensive. Now, what does that mean? Now, if you assume that you have, uh, for example, two molecules, let's take uh, two hydrogen atoms, which are so far separated from each other that they are not interacting. And then, of course, you would say that the energy of this system of two hydrogen molecules, which are uh, far apart, non-interacting, should be just twice the energy of one of the hydrogen molecules. However, if you would do these calculations at the CI single doubles calculation, so if you would calc do a CI single doubles calculation on two far, uh, hydrogen molecules far apart, and you would compare the energy which you get there with the energy of just one of the hydrogen molecules, you will see that this is not twice the energy of um, a single hydrogen molecule, which means also that uh, the CI single doubles calculations do not properly scale with the size of the molecule. Now, if you're only interested in one particular molecule, that doesn't matter. But as soon as you start to uh, do calculations on a reaction where, for example, two smaller molecules get together to form a bigger molecule, then we know that the bigger molecule is not as well described as the smaller molecule, and therefore you have uh, uh, an unbalance in your calculation and uh, your reaction energies uh, are not very good. There are ways how you sort of can uh, repair on this problem, this size extensivity problem, also in configuration interaction calculations. But people nowadays prefer to use methods 
which do not have that problem at all. Some of the methods which we're going to discuss later. One point which I have not mentioned at all, and there is a method uh, which does that, and this method is called multi-configurational self-consistent field. So it is, in a way, it's an extension of how to fork to from one Slater determinant to more Slater determinants, or you could look at it in the other way around. It is configuration interaction, where one allows to the orbitals also to be optimized at the same time. So the basic expansion of our wave function in this MCSF method is uh, precisely the same as in configuration interaction. We have a, a linear combination of Slater determinants made from some orbitals. And then we calculate the energy again as this expectation value here and we minimize uh, the energy by varying the optimizing the uh, coefficients. But while in the configuration interaction we only optimized or varied the coefficients in front of the Slater determinants here in MCSTF, we also at the same time will vary the molecular orbital coefficients. Which means we now not only have to take the derivatives of the MCSF energy with respect to the coefficient of the determinant, but also with respect to the coefficients uh, of the molecular orbitals. As a consequence of that, the equations which we obtain uh, by doing taking these derivatives are more complex than in the case of configuration interaction. And as a consequence of that, uh, it's normally not possible to have as large a CI expansions as you have in normal configuration. So we have to live with a smaller number of um, determinants. And therefore in these MCSF calculations one normally does not include all the determinants of, of the same type. So you would not include all double excited determinants or all singly excited determinants. But one takes a different approach where one selects some relevant occupied and virtual orbitals um, and then includes only all those determinants where these selected occupied orbitals are replaced by virtual orbitals. And then one does not only include single excited but also double, triple, S uh, high excited it is possible. And these selected occupied and virtual orbitals one normally calls active orbitals. And this approach actually is, is called complete active space SCF or CAS SCF. The question then of course arises, what are relevant occupied and virtual orbitals? And uh, yes, that's a very good question. And uh, to answer that question, one actually has to know a bit about the chemistry of the molecules to find out which uh, occupied orbitals would be relevant. But typically these would uh, be valence orbitals, uh, meaning the lowest virtual orbitals and the highest occupied orbitals. 